Hey everyone, this is Nick and if you want the latest Linux and open source news, you've come to the right place. This week we've got Xbox Game Pass running on the Steam Deck. Sorta. We've got Android apps in the cloud and Canonical showing a demo of that at GDC 2022. And we've got GNOME 42 being released. And of course we're gonna have today's sponsor which will let you get $100 off your Linux or gaming server. Thanks to Linode for sponsoring this video. Linode is the best choice to deploy your own Linux or gaming server. Getting started is extremely easy thanks to their app marketplace. You can just pick from one of the many, many apps they offer, select a few configuration options and just one click deploy that server. It's super simple. It works for a development environment but also for a Minecraft or Valheim server. Among the most notable apps, Linode has Moodle to create your own learning management system and teach and sell courses in minutes, but they also have stuff like Pi-hole to block ads. But please don't block mine because I need money to buy more games for the Steam Deck. From Focal Board, a Trello alternative to Rocket Chat, which is the equivalent to Slack or Teams, Linode has everything you would want. Click the link in the description to get your $100 credits and get started. Okay, so GNOME 42 was released, bringing with it a ton of improvements to the desktop environment. Among the main changes, there's a new GNOME Shell theme, simpler and more modern, a new GDK theme thanks to LibAdvita that will please minimalists and annoy people with poor eyesight or fans of skeuomorphism. And the introduction of GDK 4 is also there in a lot of default apps. That's not a small change, as it enables GPU acceleration inside of apps, so everything feels smoother and faster but it also means that people who love to theme their desktops will have more work to do to bypass the new Advita theme that LibAdvita ships. Nautilus also gets a revamped pathbar, which is way more legible, and Gnome Web gets hardware acceleration by default. I have a video dedicated to that new release, so check it out in the card up top. There are some interesting updates happening in the Gnome application world as well, as new tools see the light of day. Login Manager Settings is, for example, a new utility to let you tweak the login window of GNOME, including enabling Nightlight, changing the fonts or the general appearance, and more. There's also a new tool to preview and design symbolic icons, a Podman client called Symphony, and, more importantly, an in-development project from George Stavrakas to control a stream deck from Elgato. It already supports playing sound effects, starting and stopping streaming and recording on OBS, switching OBS scenes, or opening folders and launching applications. And yes, that's Stream Deck, not Steam Deck. But still, it's a cool project for people who use them for streaming, or just as a quick launcher for various applications and folders. Quick, someone tell Linus from LTT. Let's get it over with the GNOME stuff, as LibAdvita 1.1 and LibHandy 1.6 are released to accompany GNOME 42. These updates to the UX and design libraries for GNOME bring header suffixes, which is a way to put a widget next to the group's titles, as well as selectable titles in various rows and better cross-platform support. LibHandy has been brought up to par with LibAdvita for applications that want to make use of the in-app transitions and gestures, without locking themselves into Advita specifically or without upgrading to GTK4. It also allows GDK3 apps to support the new dark style preference implemented in GNOME 42. Now let's hope developers take advantage of that new preference quickly because it's quite hit or miss right now. The Linux kernel version 5.17 was released, a week later than what was initially planned, and it brings a few interesting features. The biggest is the new AMD P-State driver for Zen 2 and later architectures. Apparently Valve had a hand in making that driver because it's useful for the Steam Deck and it should make AMD CPUs more power efficient. There's also a new driver that should let parts of the system firmware be updated without rebooting for Intel hardware. There's also support for the USI or Universal Stylus Initiative, which is a common effort to make sure that styluses work well on all devices, whatever the vendor. BetterFS and X4 also got performance boosts, and there's a Xen USB driver to let a host pass a USB device to Xen guests. It's all very good stuff that should land in a distro near you soon. Or not so soon, depending on what you're running. If you own or want to own an M1 Mac, but also want to run Linux, there are good news. The first alpha of Asahi Linux is there, and it does just that. It works on any M1 Mac, except the Mac Studio and it supports Wi-Fi, USB 2, screens, storage, closing the lid on laptops, the keyboard and touchpad, the Ethernet ports, the SD card readers, and switching the frequency of the CPU. 
What it doesn't support yet is USB 3, speakers, and controlling the display brightness, as well as DisplayPort, Thunderbolt, HDMI on MacBooks, Bluetooth, and more importantly, the GPU and cameras. So it's a fantastic first alpha release if you like to tinker and you want to try your hand at using an M1 Mac with Linux. It's still not a ready-made solution because no support for the GPU means that your battery life will be terrible when you try to do anything that requires watching a video or scrolling on web pages or basically anything. More distro releases with Linux Mint Debian Edition or LMDE version 5. The codename is LZ and it's based on Debian Bullseye. Apart from that, nothing changes from the regular Linux Mint. You still get Cinnamon by default, the same tools and utilities, and mostly the same packages. This version is really here to have a safe way to get out of under Ubuntu's shadow if they ever piss the Mint team off too much, or if Ubuntu disappeared, although the former is much more likely. It's possible to upgrade from the beta to the final release, but not yet from the previous version of LMDE, although that will happen soon. I said it before, but I'm kinda surprised that Mint hasn't made the transition from Ubuntu to Debian as its base, seeing as they don't seem to agree with most of the decisions that Ubuntu is making these days. Looks like the work to make Snap packages faster to open on first launch on the desktop is paying off. Ubuntu published a blog post detailing some results using KDE applications that show a 33-40% to decrease in startup time thanks to the LZO compression algorithm they implemented a while back. They had already tested this with a Chromium Snap, but this new compression algorithm seems like it needs to be enabled on a per snap basis, and the KDE team will do so on the 100 plus applications they have available in the Snap Store at the same time as they'll update the applications themselves. So people using snaps to run KDE applications will probably rejoice because while that long delay is only on the first launch, it's still super annoying to have to wait multiple seconds after you actually clicked on something. Speaking of Ubuntu, 22.04 is gearing up to be a nice release, with a few improvements over the base GNOME 42 version that they'll use as a base. The first one is accent colors. We talked about it before, but they are now confirmed. This is a pretty fantastic feature that I wish was implemented everywhere, including in vanilla GNOME, and was standardized across all toolkits and desktop environments. The accent color also impacts some icons in the Yaru theme to round up the look. On top of that, the new Ubuntu logo will replace the previous one, much to the dismay of a lot of people, and the light theme will this time truly be light, including all the GNOME shell pop-up windows and context menus, which were previously black. The top panel and the dock will still remain black by default though. This move seems pretty logical, partly. Canonical announced they would be hosting a live talk at GDC 2022, presenting a cloud gaming demo using Nbox Cloud to run Android games in the cloud. The service is technically not specifically dedicated to running games. It can run any Android app that Nbox supports, but Canonical argued that gaming is the part of the service that's most in demand. The demo source code is available on GitHub for you to run it, provided that you have an Nbox Cloud commercial subscription. It will run on Ampere Ultra ARM CPUs and Nvidia Tesla T4 GPUs, and clients will connect to it using WebRTC and a specific SDK. Personally, I think the biggest use case would be to run Android apps in the cloud, but on Linux smartphones like the Pine Phone or the Librem 5. After all, these phones are always online, so running these apps in the cloud wouldn't make any difference. Nate Graham from the KDE team published another blog post detailing the advancement of the next releases of KDE Plasma and its associated apps. This time, two new bugs were fixed from the 15-minute bug initiative and KRunner will gain its own config window that also lets you disable the fact that typing when the desktop is focused would open KRunner for a search. GTK apps will now look more like KDE apps when using the Breeze GTK theme, gestures on Wayland will now be more reactive to your finger movements, and Discover will display a pop-up when installing proprietary software to warn users about their risks. I'm not sure how I feel about this specific change though, because promoting open source software is one thing, but doing it at the detriment and by criticizing proprietary software doesn't seem the right way to go about it. Although proprietary software does incur some privacy problems and risks, so I guess that's fair. The Steam Deck is receiving regular updates that improve the experience of using it. There are now new options to ignore notifications for Steam Deck rewards, going to the collections view in the library is now easier, the store performance has been improved, search is more prominent on the library page, 
and the size of the client has been removed by getting rid of unused sounds. Scrolling is now also smoother and faster and tons of issues have been fixed as well. Now still on the Steam Deck, its library has now reached 1600 playable or certified titles, including 868 of the latter. Big names recently added include Outlast 2, Halo Spartan Strike or Dota Underlords. Now there are still issues with this Steam Deck verified program, but generally you can run a playable or certified title without risking losing your sanity, if you have any left. I don't. Finally, Microsoft acknowledged the existence of the Steam Deck with an official way to run Game Pass titles on the handheld console slash PC. Well, at least if you have a good network connection, because it's using Xbox Cloud and Microsoft Edge. You can install the Edge Beta through Discover, the app store of the desktop mode of the Steam Deck, and it can then be added as a non-Steam game to be run just like any other game. Well, you will have to enter a few command lines first to make it play nice and auto-start on the right web page as well. For now, it's not completely foolproof, but Microsoft said they are actively working on making it easier. Maybe with a dedicated app available directly from Steam and that just opens Edge on the right web page, that would be cool, but I doubt they'll do that. What I don't doubt is the fact that you're gonna love today's sponsor, Slimbook. These guys make Linux laptops and desktops from Valencia, Spain. They have all keyboard layouts, they ship worldwide, and they have a huge range of laptops and desktops that you can pick from with Linux pre-installed out of the box. For example, the Slimbook 1 is a super tiny form factor PC in a wonderful aluminum enclosure it's super upgradable, it's powerful with Ryzen CPUs, it won't take up too much space on your desk, and it can do virtually anything that you would want a PC to do. So check it out using the link in the description below and get your own Slimbook device, whether it's the Slimbook One or one of their laptops. So thanks everyone for watching the video, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to throw a comment at your screen, and anything else that can help promote the channel. If you didn't like the video, you can also dislike it and tell me why in the comments. Comments are engagement and they also help promote the video, so go ahead. And if you want to help me make more of these videos, you can also join my Patreon subscribers and my YouTube members, and you'll get access to a weekly Patreon cast and the right to vote on the next topics I'll cover. So thank you everyone for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!